Welcome, everyone. My name is Nellie Koistra. Um, I'm the assistant director of the Nagel Institute. And one of our programs to advance Christian, Christian scholarship on a global scale is called the Prophets Chamber. This is a residency program for Christian scholars to spend one to four months at Calvin University. This is a time to, deep, um, to delve deep into the research within themes such as faith and science, creation care, or world religions. We've hosted scholars from Zimbabwe, Republic of Belarus, Cameroon, India, Uganda, Philippines, Democrat, Democratic Republic of Congo, and today, Malawi and Kenya. Why is this program so important? Busy Christian leaders hold multiple responsibilities. They often find it challenging to dedicate focused time to their academic pursuits. The Prophets Chamber, which was launched in 2015, is a home for these scholars, enabling them to concentrate on their dissertations, engage in rigorous study, craft articles, conference presentations, and even get traction on their next book. The results show that nearly every scholar that has been a visitor here has achieved their goals within two years of the residency. To introduce our scholars today is Damaris Parsita, the new director of the Nagel Institute. Hi, everyone. My name is Damaris Parsita, who I know it's a very hard name to pronounce. And as you've heard, I'm the new director of the Nagel Institute, just about three months old here. And so happy and delighted to meet all of you and to see you coming to listen to our scholars today. Um, I have the privilege to introduce our research uh, fellow, Dr. Joyce Mulenga from Malawi. Dr. Mulenga is a lecturer in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Mzuzu University in Malawi. She's a visiting scholar um, at the Negol Institute undertaking a library research, and her areas of interest include African indigenous religions, African Christianity, uh, Christian education, and gender studies. And today she's going to speak to us uh, on a very interesting topic, rethinking the impact of COVID-19 uh, on barrio, African barrio cultures and barrio rights, uh, tensions, paradoxes, and the well-being of affected families in Malawi. So this is how we are going to go about. She's going to speak to us for 20 minutes, and then we'll take, uh, Telesia will be the next person. I'll come back to introduce her, and then we'll take all the questions together at the end of uh, uh, the conversation. So Joyce? Please, the floor is yours. Can we give her an encouraging clap? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you for coming. And thank you for that nice introduction, our director. And I'll be speaking on the topic uh, that has already uh, been mentioned. And this presentation is part of a bigger research. Um, that a team of six people is working on in Malawi. And uh, the team is led by Associate Professor Rachel Fiedler. And the title of the project is African Traditional Values and a Theology of Health and Healing in Malawi. So one of the objectives focuses on the intersection of traditional values, spirituality, and pandemics. And uh, that's why I would like to share with you uh, my reflections and findings on this particular topic. So this is ongoing, um, and it will keep on growing, but I decided that I should share some of the findings with you. And that's the outline of my presentation, and please, this is the way to our de destination. If I get lost, guide me back. <laughs> Please remember to guide me back. Uh, so African barrio cultures and rights occupy a very important place in Africa. Uh, why? Because death is not the end of life. Uh, it is entry into the company of spirits, a transition from the visible 
to the invisible. Actually, uh, they refer uh, to those who are dead as the living dead, and then we have the living living, uh, those who are not yet dead. So because of that, the deceased must be escorted with elaborate and befitting rites, which uh, include elaborate rituals, communal participation, and significant emphasis on showing respect for the dead. And these burial rites are very, very important because they protect the living and aid a smooth transition of the dead into the realm of the living dead. So if rights are neglected, then there will be dire consequences. In other words, these rights serve for both the dead and the living. They do not just benefit one group of people. So the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the burial cultures, which are rooted in the tradition. Uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions in Malawi, a lot of changes took place in the way Africans bury their dead. And the changes prevented Malawians to bury the people in a customary way. And at times, these changes caused tensions which have affected families' well-being in the process. And what is the objective of the study? The objective of the study is to examine the impact of COVID-19 on burial cultures and rights in Karonga district. And Karonga is one of the districts in northern Malawi. And I'll, I'll also look at how uh, these uh, barriers affected the family's well-being. So the questions that this study sought to answer are, number one, how did COVID-19 disrupt the burial cultures and rights in Malawi? How did the bereaved respond to the changes that took place in the burial cultures? And thirdly, what was the impact of the COVID-19 burial cultures on the well-being of uh, Malawians? And on the theoretical framework, uh, the study employs human flourishing theory by Koryam Banda, who teases it out from Ubuntu perspective. And Banda descri describes Ubuntu as a vision of human flourishing. And human flourishing means to live one's life well. So in relation to Ubuntu, Communities know what constitutes a flourishing life, what contributes to it, and what does not. And they have to act in a way that enables them to lead a flourishing life. So for them to lead a flourishing life, the living dead must be living a flourishing life. If they flourish wherever they are, what it means is that the living will also flourish. And that's why I said the burial rights save both the living and uh, the dead. They benefit both groups. So the theory is employed to demonstrate the interconnectedness between proper burial and human flourishing. And if proper burial is performed, the dead will rest peacefully and flourish, ultimately leading to the prosperity of the living because the dead continue to participate in the life of the living. In terms of methodology, this study was qualitative in nature, and the participants were pre predominantly from rural Karonga. And 15 bereaved families were interviewed, nine of whom lost their loved ones due to COVID-19. But I also uh, interviewed families who lost their loved ones during COVID-19 era, but their loved ones did not die from COVID-19. 
but it happened during the COVID-19 era. So participants were identified through purposive and snowball uh, sampling. And Karonga was selected uh, because it is, on, it is a border district with Tanzania. Some of you may know Tanzania. So there were reports that most of the cases, COVID cases that came to Malawi came through Tanzania. So this uh, generated some interest in our team to do a study in that particular site. And of course, um, some, uh, some studies also took place in, the, in all the four administrative districts in Malawi. So Karonga was taken from the northern region and then the other three places from the other re regions in Malawi. And the study used ethnographic methods to collect data uh, since the onset of COVID-19. And all the public health protocols were followed to protect both the participants and the researchers from COVID-19. And the ethical procedures were also observed. And there will be some stories uh, that I will present um, for purposes of confidentiality. Um, codes have been used, F for female and M for males. And now moving uh, to the findings, uh, please you pardon me, I must say some things which might affect some of you, uh, because as you know, COVID-19 affected all of us, and sometimes uh, some of the stories uh, can generate some emotions in us. So um, concerning the changes uh, that took place during COVID-19 era, there were hurried and haphazard barriers. Um, normally, when somebody dies, people need time to grieve. Uh, they need time to plan what they're going to do and how they're going to bid farewell to the uh, deceased. But COVID-19 changed all that. Barriers were rapidly done. And these were done with limited communal gatherings uh, because there were restrictions even on the number of people that could gather for a funeral. And some COVID-19 victims were buried in the bush. Uh, talking about the bush, uh, in northern Malawi, in rural areas, people who live in cities or towns or in the diaspora, they are said to be living in the bush because it is the village, the home village, their ancestral home that is real home and not the city, not the town, not in diaspora. Like we are here, we are in the bush. Um, <laughs> my friend, <laughs> we are in the bush <laughs> and they, they are expecting us to go back home. So uh, these are the changes that uh, took place uh, during COVID-19 era. And because of these changes, they created some tensions. They generated a lot of tensions there were tensions or clashes between affected families and communities and medical workers because uh, some of the COVID-19 victims were buried by health workers. And there were times when, uh, there was a time when an ambulance was stoned um, because people wanted to snatch the dead body from the health worker. And at, at one point, the health worker was forced to take the body back to the mortuary because of the animosity that was there. So there were a lot of tensions uh, because people wanted uh, the body for viewing and burial. There was also tension as to whether to comply with the cultural and burial rights or COVID-19 protocols. So that tension was very evident uh, during COVID-19 era. And there was also tension between following health public health protocols or umuntu. As I've already pointed out, that communal gatherings are key uh, in Africa. And when there is a funeral, people would like to gather and mourn.
together with the bereaved. And actually, the number of people attending a funeral do matter a lot because they speak volumes about the life that the person who has died lives and the bereaved. It should, if there are many people attending the funeral, it means that uh, the deceased lived a good life and even the family that is left behind also lives a, a good life. And the tensions also were as a result of doubts about the reality of COVID-19. So many people doubted, and they could actually say, um, we, we don't believe that there is COVID-19. There were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about COVID-19. So even when the health workers were bringing the body for burial, um, they would say, no, we want to bury the body ourselves uh, because we don't believe that there's COVID-19. So they wanted the body so that they could do it uh, on their own and uh, perform the burial rites which they wanted. Uh, like I've given um, an extract from what one respondent mentioned. Um, she actually said, I doubt if she died of COVID-19. And then uh, she said, the person dies once and we need to perform the rituals uh, so that we can not be at risk um, ourselves. Because if we don't bury them properly, they may, um, they may come back and haunt us. And they also mentioned that uh, when a person dies, it's like he or she is on the journey. So when you bury them properly, it means they'll have a safe journey where they are going. And what was the impact of these barriers on the affected families? One of the impacts is that uh, those who buried their relatives without proper barriers live in perpetual fear, which means they can't flourish. They live in fear because they did not perform the uh, proper burial rites. So because of that, they are afraid of the wandering ghosts because they believe that if they're buried without appropriate rites, they may turn into a ghost and then they return to haunt them in one way or the other. Others are afraid uh, that maybe the deceased is facing the wrong direction. Uh, in Africa, especially Malawi, we have different uh, ethnic groups, and each ethnic group has got its own way of burying their dead. Yeah. And they face a particular direction, northwest or southeast, and things like that. So some COVID-19 victims were buried, were brought in bags, you know? So they would put them in a bag and then place them in a casket. So people were not sure if the deceased was facing the right direction. And some are, are worried that maybe they're facing the wrong direction because they're supposed to face where they came from. Uh, so if they came from DRC, when they're dead, they have to face DRC. Or Uganda, they have to face. So that acts as a compass direction. So if they're facing the wrong direction, they may not get to the right destination uh, because they have to rest with their ancestors. That's what happens. So they are worried. Has he arrived? If he has not arrived, who will take care of us? Because the dead continue to participate in the lives of the living. They also fear death. They may come back to take us because we didn't do the right thing. And fulfilled demands, there are some people before they die, they request certain things to be done to them in, 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 in form of burial rights. So if those demands are not fulfilled, then it becomes a problem. So Malawians feel like they're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, the ancestral spirits, who are always watching uh, what the living are doing, kind of policing if they're doing it right or doing are doing it wrong. Others uh, shared about immense stress and extreme anguish. 
And this dates back to the period when their relatives were uh, sick in isolation. Um, being um, societies which believe in community, it was unthinkable to have their relatives in isolation. They couldn't take care of them. Uh, most of the times in Malawi, when somebody is seriously sick, you find the whole village travels to the place where the person is admitted. If it is the hospital, you have 15 people waiting outside, uh, taking turns to take care of the dead, uh, of the sick. But COVID-19 did not provide that opportunity. So immense stress and extreme anguish. And stress and anguish were more remarkable for families whose loved ones were buried in the bush, as I already mentioned. Uh, those who were buried away from the family, um, they were considered to be buried in the bush. And this particular respondent actually uh, mentioned that uh, we are not sure where they are facing. Perhaps they're facing the wrong direction. Uh, we don't know. So that will have an impact uh, on, on them. But I also want to share uh, this one family, which I call it the old one out. Thank you. Uh, the old one out family, um, they shared a different story. Even though this family lost their loved one due to COVID-19, um, they accepted and said there are times when these things do happen. Uh, we just have to accept and adjust to the changes that are taking place. And they equated the death of their loved one uh, who was hurriedly buried to one killed by an animal or a crocodile where they didn't uh, have an opportunity to recover the body. So they said it works the same. So uh, they accepted it. And, but of course, they lamented about the lack of community support because restrictions couldn't allow people to come. And another thing I want to share quickly is about COVID-19 and <coughs> mental health issues. Um, that as I was doing this study, I found out that there is lack of understanding of mental health issues, and as a result, it is very difficult uh, to deal with it. This misunderstanding leads to misdiagnosis and mistreatment of uh, victims due to issues of um, causation. And because of the issue of causation, many uh, turned to traditional healers and experts because they thought those are the ones that could um, help them. So what we see here is the inevitability um, of change and implementation of solutions. Um, it's like the COVID-19 pro protocols were imposed uh, instead of uh, the officials engaging the communities in the uh, right way. And our desire for proper burial uh, and human flourishing. And people wanted to preserve their um, culture. And um, what I'm trying to say is that COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted the burial cultures of Malawi, particularly the people of Karonga. And this sudden shift has resulted in tensions. Therefore, it is essential uh, to take a meticulous approach when implementing solutions to crises like COVID-19, considering the cultural context and uh, adopting holistic approach. So it is important that when solutions are being implemented, uh, there must be uh, care so that a people's well-being must not be affected. Uh, many thanks. Zikomo Kwambiri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an interesting and illuminating study, Joyce. You did a brilliant job. Keep all the questions and uh, we'll ask them at the end of um, the day. Do you want to come here? Um, <clears throat> our next presenter, um, whom I have the absolute pleasure to introduce to you, 
uh, is my friend and colleague from Kenya, uh, Telesia, Dr. Telesia Musili, um, who is a lecturer at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Nairobi. She's also a research fellow at the University of South Africa. And as of yesterday, she is the Deputy General Secretary of the African Association for the Study of Religion, where I serve <laughs> as president. And I am so honored about that because I've been the only woman in the association. Uh, and finally, I have my sister uh, with me, helping me to run an organization that studies uh, you know, religion from scientific perspectives. Her research interests involve around the intersections of religion, ethics, media, environment, and focusing on the response to contemporary issues affecting women and society at large. Um, she's going to speak to us about unmasking the authenticity of the values of communality in Kenya, digital churches in post-COVID-19 uh, phase. Karibu sana. Welcome. And, uh, asante, asante. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Damaris, uh, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I will take us through the unmasking of the African values of communality uh, in Nomia Church. But before I do that, I will just give us a very brief uh, overview of uh, our project. Um, our project uh, talks about African values of communality and religious experiences in the virtual space amidst COVID-19, a comparative study of three selected churches in Kenya. And it has a team of uh, seven members, uh, which I am uh, leading. And we are doing a comparative study in three churches in Kenya. That is the Presbyterian Church of East Africa, uh, which is a mission-founded church. Nomia Luo Church, and the first African independent church in Kenya. By independent church, we mean that the churches that broke away from the missionary founded uh, uh, churches. And then Christ is the answer ministries. These churches were purposefully selected uh, because they had a social media trail uh, in running of their church services. And this was our major component because we wanted to look at the impact of uh, COVID-19 and uh, the move of the physical church into the physical, I mean, into the virtual uh, space. I have several photos that will just help us get through uh, the presentation. And the first one is um, Presbyterian Church of East Africa, which was uh, started in the year 1946. And what happened, of course, we had the assumption that they might not move uh, into the virtual space because of their conservativeness. Uh, you know, they're quite conservative. But then we realized that immediately COVID hit, then they started borrowing, borrowing equipment in the very first month uh, of, uh, you know, virtual streaming of live uh, services. Uh, then we have the Nomia Luo Church, and Nomia Luo Church, as I've said, was begun in the year 1912 by Johanna Owalo. And we see a young man there uh, using a mobile phone from the bishop to live stream their service. This is how they started. And the assumption with the Nomia Church, because it is a very conservative church as well, we thought going to the field that they will not move into the virtual space. And so this was, again, uh, a surprise that we got, that they were really willing to run their churches in the virtual space, owing to uh, COVID-19. The other church that we uh, sampled is Christ is the Answer Ministries, which was started in the year 1959, a very enterprising church, uh, quite progressive, and mostly housing people within the urban center and middle class people in, uh, in Nairobi County and Nairobi City, so to say. And so they had already moved into the virtual space. They ran their churches in the virtual space using Zoom. They have a radio station. They have a TV station. And so CITAM kind of become, became the church for everyone immediately COVID it because the rest were struggling to get into the virtual space. And so it was just like, 
you know, the model. We look up to them because they have already started it. And so we picked these distinct and diverse churches to see how the values of communality were really impacted on by the COVID-19 pan, uh, uh, pand pandemic. We have a diverse team, a group of seven, all mixed together in religious studies, pastoral theology, and the like, a really wonderful team. But now I turn to my uh, topic on unmasking the authenticity of the values of communality, and I am leaning mostly on uh, Nomia Church because this is where I spend most of my time, almost a whole year, so I will have uh, a bias on uh, this particular church, but of course, in as much as it was a comparative study, I might not get uh, into the comparatives. I'm using the word unmasking because from our study, we did realize that it had a connotation. When people put on masks in Nairobi, Kenya, we were at a season when politicians were campaigning. And so people thought that we're being told to mask so that they can eat. You know, we were put in our houses, we were locked down, but the politicians were out campaigning. And so it, it brought in kind of a social political component that those who mask have to be in the house. They are the rich people, they are the affluent. And of course, the masking, the, ma the type of mask, of course, had a connotation as well. If you have the medical one, one use, then you are rich. If you have the material one made by the tailors, then you belong to a different ca category. Then from a sociological perspective as well, it was seen as an ob obstacle for nonverbal communication, hindering social relations, friendship, which really affirm and maintain social contact. So this is how I am using the word unmasking, the values of uh, communality. This was the complaint. And so I try to frame the problem that I'm trying to work out here, and I am arguing that the growth of internet technology in the 21st century impacted the African values of communality. And by communality here, I talk about the shared interests that promote unity, togetherness, and kinship structures and cooperation among uh, human persons. And so the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 challenged our physical and social interactions that would necessitate our socializations. And so this brought in cancellation of physical worship services, and ceremonies, Jess has already told us about uh, the barriers and everything else. And so as a result, our socializing was pushed into the virtual space, especially doing church. And this prompted people's way of you know, deconstructing the way we live, we construct new ways of living, and we try to reorganize uh, the way we would do church and experience uh, you know, our religious practices. And so we did note that this, to most, especially the NOMIA team and the PCA group, became a new virtual reality. It was their first time. So how would we grapple with this among us so many challenges? And so this became a reality for all of us that we had to grapple with. And so one of the things that I would want to note is in Kenya, we have really progressed and we have witnessed a significant internet usage and connectivity growth in recent years. We are talking about a percentage of 87.2% uh, out of 56 million people in Kenya. So we are talking about, you know, around 46 million people using internet through mobile phones and the like. And so we thought that this particular component and following church services using our mobile phones had just brought a new way of doing church. And so I sought to examine the adoption and the impact of virtual space on the African values of communality within the Nomia church. And Nomia church uh, mostly is found within the very poor suburbs in Nairobi, in the, in the slums. This is where we will find these particular churches. And so, as I said, we had kind of an assumption that they will not get into the virtual space because they don't have mobile phones. They are, they are poor. They are in the slums. There is no internet. Power outage, this is, and this was the condition. But of course, uh, 
we were shocked once we, we, we got there. And so uh, I got two uh, scholars from the foundation of my literature review and talking about technology being beneficial in providing information, but can also be detrimental. And it can alter the values and principles that underpin societal traditions and culture, as uh, Charlotte so uh, already of us. We also talk about Taiwa telling us that communalism and its cognates continue to exercise a very firm grip on the African intellectual imagination. So, of course, people have talked about the philosophical component of uh, Ubuntu, as uh, Joyce has already alluded. And this forms actually my theoretical framework or a theory. I use African, theo uh, African communalism theory uh, that BT tries to bring out in a maxim, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. This becomes the African philosophy that uh, guides our socialization. Desmond Tutu, uh, in trying to understand, uh, BT says, I am because I belong. I have to have that sense of belonging, and so I need other human beings in order to be human. And this is what uh, you know, most of the Africans and even Kenyans are socialized uh, to be. And so it becomes a world view of collected values, values that revolve around solidarity, one, oneness, uh, of course, even with up to including the earth communities, the environment, nature, and everything else. And on these two aspects, uh, we have the adjustments they are trying to give us. The two dichotomies they are talking about, there is an aspect of identity, and there is the aspect of solidarity. And solidarity talks about the well-being of each and every other uh, persons that we relate with. Of course, it talks about aid, but we didn't talk about aspects of aid. We try to uh, push that uh, a little bit further and talk about welfare, which comes to Africans as responsibility, but not as sympathy or empathy. So on the right side of it, we try to dispute that, and this is coming and emanating from our data. On the methodology section, we had a research permit uh, just from uh, you know the Kenyan Commission for Science, uh, Technology and Innovation, but then our field work was held uh, for a while until October because of the virus. We waited until it subsided, and I said this is because Nomia is really a crowded church, I would say, uh, and so being in their situation and context, they were not really following the protocols as quite so. <laughs> Uh, we, we shall uh, do that. And so we realized this because keeping distance to them was not tenable. Their churches are small, they are in the slums, so space is really like a treasure. And so we were like, okay, we have to protect ourselves. So we waited for some time. When the lockdown was open and we, they could allow 50 members, they all came. So we had to really navigate, uh, navigate that. So Nomiya Church Isli is the main center where we spend most of our church. We had two churches that were online in Nomiya, Kariobangi no, uh, Nomiya Church and uh, Isli. But then after like two months, Kariobangi stopped uh, streaming their services online. So we also had to stop uh, visiting them and uh, following them online. And so we engaged either the pastors or the leadership of the church. So Nomiya Church, just to give us uh, a little background, apart from just being started by Owalo in 1912 and being the first independent church in Africa, it is dominated by Luo ethnic group in Kenya, which is the fourth largest. I know those of us who follow the politics of Kenya, we understand Raila Ondinga. This is where he belongs, and I'm not trying to stereotype anything, but then they inhabit the western part of you know, eastern part, western part of Kenya. They are the majority, uh, of course, in the Nomiya Church, starting away in Assembo, uh, you know, one of the really, an altaric or a very sacred uh, space for the Nomiya people. One of the issues that forced Nomiya out of the Anglican Church in the year 1908 is because Christianity brought about issues to do with monogamy. And so they're like, we are a polygamous group. And so he said that God visited him and told him, you have to circumcise Luo men 
Blue men never used to be circumcised before 1908. And so God appears to Owalo and tells him, circumcise them on the eighth day when they are born, only for the boys. And so again, taking a very Jewish, uh, you know, component and the patriarchal aspect, uh, you know, just uh, comes in. And so he did reject, uh, you know, the divinity of Jesus Christ, he rejected uh, the concept of Trinity, because he, he did just argue that, you know, they are not of the same substance with God. God cannot exist in three persons. And this was his understanding. Um, and then a few aspects uh, of uh, Islam culture. So we did an ethnographic uh, method. We employed ethnographic methods in our data collection. We had several cut out and really planned on the table. But the moment we went into the field, everything just in, went haywire, and then we were like, she is my, <laughs> she, is, <laughs> she is my advisor, and I was like, I don't know what we are doing here. <laughs> so she said, you need to know what to do, because I will not help, and so she was like, uh-huh, you can change. And so, yeah, we got into the Nomia Church, and I just want to share with us the surprises that we got there. Uh, one of the things that we found the first day we went there is they just speak in Doluo. That is their language. Their services, everything is in their language. That was like, okay, what do we do? Accessibility to them was, again, a major issue. We went there with our permit, and the assumption as a researcher is, oh, we're going to collect data, and so we have the permit. And so the bishop came that particularly because we had to make phone calls and it was like, you want to see these researchers. And the first thing he said in Dolua is like, you are all women. And so we were like, okay, yes, we are all women. So he says, you will talk to her. So we went talking to another lady and now she told us, now we do things differently here. You don't talk to our men directly. So you need to get a man to talk to them. So, okay, and they will not speak to you in either English or Swahili. But come again next week. So we went back. We sat into their church, uh, very tedious, uh, but we did that. You know, we join at 9 and you get out at 3 p.m. But then you have to, but the, the good thing is there was food, a lot of food after church and tea. <laughs> and, so we had no problems being there. So. In the access, you get to realize that you get guides. People will really support you using the relationships. They will tell you, talk to so-and-so, talk to so-and-so. But then we also have ghosts. We started collecting data among us. women. We had one focus group, and one of them sneaked to the bishop and said, they are asking us questions about marriage and about purity. So we were stopped. Don't come again for three months. So we were out and negotiating again. The other surprise was... Uh, Women, gender, uh, I know you can locate me here. And so we had to dress in a particular manner. We had to cover ourselves to everything. No earrings, you cover your head, long dresses for us to be accepted because we had to portray humility for us to be accepted in, uh, in the church. And so reflexivity became an interesting component in the Nomia church. And so for us to collect data, and this is going to the fourth month, we were told that we had to have a uniform. So this is how we went to our fields for a whole year. So I had to be very white, very clean every Sunday. And of course, I'll talk about the headscarf. We see lots of, we will see different, different colors in Nomia. There will be a hot pink, like you see my bag, and blue, that is for men. Uh, and then we will have another blue that uh, my colleague has, and yellow. Yellow uh, will be donned by women who have undergone through particular studies of submission. They go through the entire book of Titus and some Pauline uh, literature, and you show that you know how to submit. So the gender bias and play uh, is very much in, in Nomea, and these are the kind of things that we had ready to, to work on. And so, again, we encountered a few 
uh, ethical issues that are at least there. Who owns the data in the virtual space? You find one thing today and tomorrow it's gone. Informed consent becomes a continuous process. You know, it's, uh, you keep on like asking, can I take your photo? It's not a one-off a thing. So uh, very fast into the findings. Uh, one of the things that we realized and people said is the concept of e exclusion. And I would want to invite us to see the age uh, in, you know, of our respondents, of course, saying that we were not ready, nobody was ready, especially for them. And then uh, the pastor talks about liturgy. When there are no people, there is no liturgy, uh, you know, as quiet. And so really shunning uh, virtual space. Uh, the youth would say, yeah, it's a nice space. Of course, you'll not do much before going to church. You just need to grab your phone. And so this, let's do whatever it is that the government is telling us. At the end of the day, we will get there. Then we talk about then um, giving offerings and tithes. Uh, that was a disconnect. We talk about Lipa na Mpesa. Mpesa is a money transfer service in Kenya, which of course is uh, flourishing, uh, an e-banking platform. And so we, we use, they, they use that, but uh, the Nomiya team really shunned that. So when they came back to church, uh, this is what uh, they wanted to do. And I have just a video for you. A little <laughs> To my findings, we talk about interrelational welfare, uh, very much uh, people talking about we can only experience that when we meet together. Uh, and so if for the virtual space, I think what we found in Nomia is the welfare group, which was run through the WhatsApp uh, platform. This is what they love. You can send money because community is everything to them. What am I teasing out? One of the things that I am looking at is the component of social change and kind of seizing the moment. Uh, and what I try to imagine is COVID-19 brought about an aspect of uh, a new church, uh, a new way of doing church, being into the virtual space. Those that cannot be in the physical space can also be in the virtual assembly. Can we uh, kind of seize the moment? And so because our assumption was the Nomiya church cannot jump into the virtual space like, oh, they tried to seize the moment. And so I'm like, is this anything that we can uh, try to adopt that a new posture of undertaking, you know, this collective, uh, you know, values, being together and kind of uh, fulfilling the Great Commission. Can, is it a new way of going instead of physically going? Can you, can we look at it as a way of transpassing it in, into the virtual, into the virtual space? Again, a new way of trying to be true to God's mission and world Christianity, we transverse once we sit behind our computers and we have seen that uh, even in doing our meetings through Zoom and everything else, presenting our papers. And again, extending our communality beyond the physical, uh, you know, I tried to bring in the verses there and painted them yellow just to see whether I have uh, attained the yellow scarf. It's like, uh, <laughs> so you know we have where two or three are gathered. Is it just in the physical space or is it in the virtual space? And so let us not give up the habit of meeting together in Hebrews 10, 25. Do we hold because we cannot approach the altar or can we really move into the virtual space? And so what am I... Uh, my concluding remarks, and one of the things that I am uh, teasing out from my data is that African values of communality, especially within the Nomia Church, are better experienced within the physical settings. When we, I can see people, when I can talk, I can see your facial expressions, you know, we can cooperate, you know, I call you my brother, my sister, and all things like that. It is better experienced when we meet, but not in the virtual space. There are these avatars, and probably you might not be, uh, you know, expressing uh, your expressions as what appears uh, on the screen. So we also did realize that the social economic stunting played a major role into uh, adopting uh, into the virtual space. Talk about internet connectivity. Some people you've seen from the data talking about such challenges. The technological know-how, hedge divide, 
and even gender divide was a major uh, again, deterrent uh, in the Nomia church. Of course, this would be different in churches like Sitam uh, uh, and PCE. And so the church of the future really adopting a blended posture. Now we can have physical and a virtual space. Uh, and I'm like, this is uh, a kind of a, a social change that has been prompted by technology and the pandemic. And so it's giving us a way of let us jump or let us have an alternative when this comes and we can have a, a way of uh, exiting or doing church or practicing our relig uh, religious experiences even in the virtual space. And for that, I appreciate my three churches, Nomia uh, Church, that's their flag, and uh, Sitam Church, uh, their logo, then uh, PCA Nagel Institute, Calvin University for hosting us, even though it's very cold, uh, University of Nairobi, where I am. Thank you so, so much. And thank you for coming. Especially the surprises of uh, a researcher going to the field. There's a very big difference between going to the field and entering the field and encountering all kinds of uh, scenarios and uh, one of the most memorable things about her going to the field was how she would constantly call me <laughs> to air her frustrations. Oh, they won't speak to me because I'm a woman. They won't speak to me because I'm in, in, in my pants. I, they won't speak to me because of this and that. And, you know, I, I laughed my heart out just seeing how she had to get a new tailor, a dressmaker to get her the dress that was appropriate for the church. So I really, really enjoyed that. It brought to life so many memories of our stories back in Kenya. And, and thank you. Thank you for such a beautiful presentation. Now, I'll open this for a question. So um, if you have any questions, just raise your hands. And um, I think we only have one mic. So, but uh, you can shout, isn't I it? Just shout. Yeah, absolutely. So go ahead, Joy. So, Joyce, <laughs> toward the end of your presentation, you had on the slide that there were tensions between Christians and the African mm -hmm. traditional religion, but you didn't have time to talk about what that was. So, right. can you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much yeah. for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, the tension uh, between uh, Christians, it was concerning uh, getting help when it comes to mental health issues. Uh, because as I said, uh, there is lack of understanding on mental health issues. Uh, most of the times when one is having mental health issues, people think that they are possessed by spirits. Yeah, so because of that, they go to a traditional healer for help. And um, the issue is those who are Christians, I specifically pointed out those from Presbyterian Church, their church does not allow them to seek help from traditional healers. So there is that particular tension. Those who are not Christians of that church, they go to the traditional healers and they get the help that they need. But those who are Christians, they can't go. If they go, they'll be excommunicated. So there was that tension uh, for those who are Christians. Should we go to the traditional healers and get ex excommunicated? Or, but the help lay in the traditional healers. I hope I've answered it. That's, that, that is not what I was guessing was the tension. <laughs> so that's, that's very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Can I? ask an extension of that question sure. because even when you spoke and i took a note on it um you passed briefly over it mm. and the issue is colonialism mm. and if you don't engage colonialism and all of its spider-like fingers in the contemporary you my experience is that one can miss what's really going on and this example, it sounds as though that's perfect example because the Presbyterian church is not the church that evolved out of the people right. themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means it was, is a colonial presence there mm -hmm. and it is now forbidding them to be themselves, mm -hmm. which is the big tension and it's not just in 
Kenyan countries, Malawi. Mm. It's I mean, I hear it in the United States of America, mm. so I'm pushing it back. Do you ever get an opportunity to engage the tentacles of colonialism as they present as life experiences of people today, mm. living life, are presenting them clearly, but not using the language that we use because that's colonial. Oh, that's a very important point. Uh, of course, I didn't look at it from that perspective, but I think it's something that is worth pursuing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that and see uh, how it can be incorporated. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. This, this is just a, a bit of an observation, but also a question. In, mm. in both of your presentations, what was striking to me is that COVID-19 immediately affected practices. Mm -hmm. Say again? It immediately affected practices. Mm -hmm. and, and usually, at least in, in Western cultures, we think about, we say, okay, the, the frame would be that we start with principles and values, and principles and values inform our practices. And it's almost as if COVID-19 reversed everything. Mm -hmm. It's like practices then reverse the flow and start to affect principles and values. So I'd be interested to see if you think that is in effect what's part of what's going happening, that this shifted practices because of COVID-19 is now reshaping principles and values. Is that the case in the studies that you've been doing? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. No, uh, I, I think looking at it also from a, a human rights perspective, so many people talked about their rights being infringed because they're like, don't go, do, do, do. So I, I think it is uh, the directions and the protocols that were just kind of just step, stepping on what they are supposed to do. So it was not on the values instantly, but it was more on what they are doing. So it's a practice to us, I would say that, and probably our data would speak to that as well. Don't do, don't do. So they were not like, you know, put on a mask. They were like, stay at home. So this is kind of like, you are, it's more of the doing and the practice, I would say that. Yeah. Can I expand on this? I don't want to push too hard, but part of the difficulty I would propose, and I'm not under what I would propose, mm -hmm. part of the difficulty of the 21st century is that some of us are very separated, pulled far away mm -hmm. from what colonialism represents. And others of us live in the middle of it. Now, I'm not being abstract or theoretical because my research has been in Cuba with traditional Africa-inspired women and honest. I know exactly what was going on. Color-wise, drums, I know, I know it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so the point I'm attempting to make is we who sit in the Western world are separated from what colonialism is and the, the global South in all earnesty, all haven't been separated out because we have not yet, we of the North, have not yet accepted the fact that they have a legitimate equal place in what this globe is to be. So we're looking at them from our perspective, trying to see, stop. <laughs> I don't want Uh, well, uh, it's, I think it's a comment. I'll take it as a comment. And, and uh, I, I think it's something that we still want to engage with. Uh, you know, it's a different eye, a different lens uh, that we didn't engage with. And so uh, it's something that we can always try to see how we get there. Yeah, but I think it's so important mm -hmm. that we see that it's within mm -hmm. post-colonial. Yeah. Um, um, how many things you know? Um, many Africans live in a fluid world or, you know, between Christianity, religion, culture, and, and, and Western, you know, Western yeah. human rights ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, sort of an intersection and an overflow of all these uh, things colliding into one, creating someone who is really neither here nor there. And we saw that during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think it's really important that uh, um, 
you take seriously the perspective of uh, post-colonial uh, uh, Africa and how you know people are moving within uh, that space. How are they negotiating, uh, and how did colonialism affect their value cultures or you know whatever we are talking about? Yes, sir. Yeah. One brief little bit of question. Honest, on the diaspora. Am I still in the bush? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. You need to go back home. No, I've been back. Home. I had an African say much more deeply to me as a diaspora person. Yes. Um, the, our problem is that we have no. No one has done the ritual that unites our spiritual world people and our present day people. No one passed on those rituals. Do you follow me on that? Yes. So that we are 30 million folks over here and no spirits to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm no longer in the bush, I've been told, but at the same time, I know what that means. So when you said I wanted to fall out that day. <laughs> I kind of didn't look at it as a, a bush situation uh, in my context. What I did look at is um, how my family thinks that I'm homeless. Like, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. <laughs> where is home for you? Mm. Why you go there? Why are you? Why are you where you are? You know, um, there's, there's just a feeling that I'm not home. Like, there's a lack of acceptance that America could be home that I belong to Kenya and, and that's home. So there's the idea of homing and home and, and being and home is, 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 is very confusing to me. So introducing a, a Bush concept really scares the hell out of me. I'm already homeless. I have been a Bush. <laughs> So anyway, I, I think it's, in, it's it's so important to engage, you know, how, how people read the world and think some of these ideas. Yeah. Any other question? Students? <laughs> Wonderful students. <laughs> <laughs> I know the Dominican Republic. You better have a to ask any question. There is no right or <laughs> you should ask it. This is a really safe space. <laughs> You can ask the questions about your position. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, as as you were both talking, I was just thinking about, you know, not in the African um, text, but in comparing the example just here um, in my own congregation, and um, you know, there, there's not. There, there are very rituals. There are you know, rituals, and they couldn't happen in COVID. But it's still different because I don't think it has the tightness of connection between mm -hmm. the world beyond and the, the ability of the world beyond this life to reach back mm -hmm. uh, into this life, the fact people here. Mm -hmm. um, but, but church has still had unresolved grief two books, mm -hmm. dollars who died either from COVID or something. Mm -hmm. was, we finally concluded we had to do, as COVID receded, we had to do a special service mm -hmm. for everybody in the church who had, had someone who had died due to COVID. But we had, and, and it was it was a very good thing to do it because mm -hmm. it was addressing. But you know there are other things that happened. For example, a couple of things that happened. Okay, so how do you how do you do your Eucharist? How do you do communion mm -hmm. all virtual? Mm -hmm. So people got used to staying home, going to their kitchen, getting orange juice and crackers, mm -hmm. and having communion at home, isolated. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the other side of COVID nineteen, and they develop that as an acceptable pattern. Pattern. And so then we had a discussion about well. Really, it's supposed to be a communal meal where we are all together. How do we get them to come back in person when we are when we have you know Eucharist together? And it's a struggle. Um, and and then you get people who are homebound because they're elderly and can't get out easily. So finally, we said, well, if you can't come to us, then we will come to you, but we will send more people. We will send at least a couple people out to be with you. So they still some. But you know, it's all that sort of thing, like offerings. Um, we don't pass an offering plate anymore, which is common in most churches historically in these days. Why? Because people learn more and more about online giving because they had to, and then they didn't go back. Mm. 
So that was like, well, if you pass an offering plate, it's going to look weird because <laughs> one person's going to put money in, and then two or three people aren't, and the other people looking at them. Well, put money in, they'll say, well, those people aren't giving. <laughs> but they are, yes. but they're giving online. And oh, you right. yeah. 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 But then you think, well, an offering is part of a regular service mm -hmm. of worship. So we had to redesign it. And so we finally said, we're still going to have the, the deacons bring forward an offering plate, explain what it's for, pray for it, but people are going to give up. Well, and we're not going to pass a plan anymore because practice doesn't you know, match how we've morphed because of the pandemic. So I'm guessing these, I, I'm just giving some, some similar examples to say that I think practices that we were necessary backed us into a different space. Mm -hmm. And now, now we're back to kind of trying to sort out the principles and values mm -hmm. that match the shift in our practices. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything from other historical crises? Probably. Yeah. Probably. That's what I was asking in the actual context, because I would suggest there is, but do we have it even in the, in the Western world? I mean, what did churches do during the plague? And that's, I know that's on the whole, oh, I was a third grade church of so long ago, but still, but yeah, we got data on that stuff. We got lots of data. We know, for example, that some people survive, and if you got that DNA, you will be strong. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like so, the, yeah, the Spanish flu epidemic. Okay. That works. I, I don't know what churches did. Whether I was, I think Nobody bothered to even. I, I'm well, not focusing. I, I have read some of that, and yeah. it seems to me that the churches did close in the the flu epidemic. But when they came back, the model had to be well. We yeah. come back in person because there was no the, virtual, virtual world yeah. didn't yeah. exist. Right. So it's it's the point. Yeah, it's the virtual object, which is huge. I thought your stuff was so interesting. Uh, I, I came across a study, and I can't recall that, um, that church, uh, donations of money really multiplied for many people during the COVID-19 pandemic. People are not going to church, but they are able to donate so much. So, you know, we see all kinds of transformation and changes taking place. People are not physically meeting, but people are preparing to give uh, the Amani, I think it's important also to take that. Yeah. Any other question? This is really lovely, and uh, the students are not asking questions. <laughs> no. Yeah, but, but, but I just wanted to share one story concerning the bush. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had it. I don't know if you read it. Uh, the story. Uh, the, the issue is there is one person who was buried in the capital city. Uh, yeah, 600 it. kilometers away from the whole okay. village. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after COVID, they had to go and exhume the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drive it 600 kilometers. I don't know what's that in terms of miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to bury it back home so that they could perform everything. Befitting, <laughs> yeah, burying rats. Huh. So, <laughs> yeah, they didn't want to the body to rest. That's right. Yeah, in the bush, but it had to be brought home. Rest with the assistance. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think this has been very exciting, and I um, look forward to hosting many of these events next time. Thank you so much for coming. Um,